Hey, this is Kayla Iacovino with TrekMovie.com. I'm here at San Diego Comic Con 2017 with Neville Page, creature designer extraordinaire. So, uh, Neville, I know you've worked on um, all the three J.J. Abrams Star Trek films. Um, you know, what, what for you were some of the different distinct challenges for working on all three of those different films? Well, the first two were J.J. and then the last one was Justin Lin. And so there was a little bit of a difference just in terms of how, the approach to the film, the third one. The challenge has always been trying to, well, it's twofold. You're trying to do what the director wants and desires and, and be uh, responsible for their vision. But because it's Star Trek, you're also trying to do what you can anticipate that the fans want. and. It's not that they're ever opposing, it's just that they're ever so slightly different because the fans often want what it is they know so well and a director's job, a producer's job is to try and take it to the next level, evolve it a bit. So I remember the, coming here to Comic-Con and seeing the reveal of the cast for the first time of Star Trek thinking to myself, and this is of course no offense to JJ, but I thought to myself, how is he possibly gonna pull off a contemporary Kirk Spock, Uhura, it seemed impossible, but I think that's one of the greatest things about J.J., having done Star Wars as well, he takes on the impossible and he achieves it. So because of that, you know you're in good hands when you're being given direction by somebody who's so capable at doing the impossible. And the hardest thing really was doing right for J.J. and doing right for the audience, especially when we started to step into the specific canon, specific characters. Klingons obviously are something where, you know, I was very nervous at the beginning, but we didn't have to address it entirely in the first film, but Into Darkness, we had to address it specifically. And that's when it was like, ooh, ooh this is gonna be a tough one. But I love those kind of challenges. So, and Klingons are specifically an interesting one, um, but first of all, let me ask you this. How much familiarity, familiarity did you have with Trek before starting on 2009? Familiar in your very basic audience way. I was not a Trekkie. I was a person who, as a kid, I grew up with it and I loved it, I enjoyed it. It scared me, it thrilled me, all those things. But I didn't know the history of characters. And at the time when, of course, it first came out, it was just a show with a little bit of history, a little bit of backstory. But as it evolved with the fans, they refined the story, they refined the backstory, particularly with the Klingons. Again, is that the Klingons are such a complex, well thought out race, and it's not because the writers originally wrote it that way, it's because the fans built upon that base. And that's where you realize that the audience owns a portion of this themselves. Unlike other franchises where it's written for an audience, this one is kind of like the canon of these characters was the birth of that was, of course, the writers, but then the fans, as you can see, even at Comic-Con, they're the ones that evolved it. So that's, again, that, that, that interesting place of being true to what the director wants, but true to what the fans, I was going to say expect, demand. <laughs> and that's, you, so you can't satisfy everyone, of course. Can you talk a little bit about your process in terms of, you know, how how much are you working with the directors and producers? How much is it your own creation? And how much do you feel, I guess, maybe pressure to, to adhere to certain things that the fans expect? You know, writing that line of making something new versus versus you know, rehashing those old themes. The, the last question is probably the easiest, is you feel a lot of pressure to do right for the the hardcore fans. But at the same time, as a designer, as somebody who likes to reinvent things, you want to... There was a point when the Klingons looked a certain way. And then there was another point where the Klingons changed. Who made that decision? A creative person, a director, a writer, a producer made that decision, and an artist helped kind of visualize what that was. And we have done that on all of these Star Trek films where you know you can't you can't satisfy everyone's desires and, and do their expectation. There's the classic that you want to make sure that in the silhouette, speaking metaphorically, the silhouette of something, it feels, it still feels like it is uh, whatever. But then there's a whole new audience of people 
that's going to come into this that, have, that aren't familiar, aren't Trekkies at all, that you feel like it's an opportunity to give them something that has evolved because you're also, you have to evolve the aesthetic that is more contemporary. It's the same thing with fashion. You, know, you look at a picture of yourself 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it's like, I can't believe I, w I wore that. At the time, that's what you wore. So the same thing is true of design. As you evolve something, you, you just have to accept that it, it needs to be updated, whether it's with techniques, new makeup techniques, new makeup materials, silicone versus latex, for example. Film is now, um, and digital and film, is high res, 4K, changes everything because now you can see everything. Detail. The detail, so you have to change your approach to the techniques that you have. Uh, and so all of that adds up to stuff just needs to evolve. So do you stay purely classic? I don't know, I, th I think it's, it's a balance that you can never satisfy everyone. I've been, I've been reading online about how people feel about the, the Klingons in Discovery, and there's people that love it and people that do not love it at all. And Yes, in a perfect world, you'd like everyone to love what you do, but what is most important is that people aren't in the gray area of eh, ambivalence. I don't really care, really, it's fine, I guess. Strong opinions are what actually help things evolve. You've got one side debating with another side, which is very much the Trekkie world I've been paying attention to, and because of that passion about it, um, it it'll, it, I was going to say allows us to, it, it, it doesn't force us, it, it provokes us, it uh, inspires us creators of these types of shows to really, really pay attention to what the needs are and what the hopes are and address it as best as we can. Doesn't always work out, but everyone that's worked on this production on Discovery, not on every Star Trek, quite frankly, but everyone on Discovery has done such a phenomenal job of really walking that fine line of canon, um, evolution and expectation. So as a, as a designer, when you're going in and you're getting ready to see your creature on the screen and hear these reactions from fans, be it any of the Star Trek movies or Discovery, which isn't out yet, you know, what are your hopes and fears going into the theater or reading the reviews online? You know, what is it that you're hoping people will feel when they see your creatures? Uh, a connection to them. Uh, one that is hopefully an appreciation of its character first, because uh, what I am to do is supply an aesthetic that is adhering to the narrative. The story is what matters the most. And the character design, the creature design, the costume design, whatever it is that we do, if it's a distraction from that trajectory, then we kind of done the wrong thing. But then, on top of that, when a character comes out for the first time or a creature comes out, you're also supposed to offer something new that makes an audience go, that is cool. That's technically a distraction. But I, I've kind of equated it to this. It's just, it only just occurred to me recently, reading some of the reviews in the hopes that what we're doing works, and just all the stuff that I work on, all the films I work on. And that is, I, I equate it to a haircut. You know, Friday you leave work, and everyone says goodbye. Monday you come in and you've got a haircut. And it's a, it's a major change. And everyone's like, oh my God, you changed your hair. And it's a topic and everyone's talking about it. And you're like, oh, should I have done that? And then by 5 p.m., you don't even remember what the hair was like before. And that is kind of what all of this is. There's an expectation, it's a surprise, it's a bit of a shock. Give it a moment. You're still going to like that person that's got the new haircut. Their narrative is still there. That's all that matters. Well, it's not all that matters. That's the most important thing. How it's dressed, how it's changed, that is an important thing for people that embrace change and want to see something fresh. And you just have to accept that not everyone's going to be satisfied. And that's, that's okay. And if you can't handle that, meaning us as designers, then don't read the blogs <laughs> don't go online because there's some harsh criticism out there. You can't have an ego. N no, no. You, it, it's, and you don't. You know, the people that love you, it's great. And the people that hate you, it's great. They have a strong opinion. And if you let either of those people influence your decisions, 
it's no longer a pure motivation. You have to be true to what you believe is right. Your opinion is no different than other people's opinions. We all have an opinion, but once you lose the stability and your conviction, that's when things start to unravel. So on Discovery, if I may ask this, um, are you the lead creature designer? Are you the guy calling all the shots? Or are you sort of part of a bigger team? What's your, what would you say your role is? Uh, it, you're always part of a bigger team. And even if you're, you seemingly are taking the lead on something, you're, you're still part of the bigger picture. And you know, I've often said this about every single creature I've designed. When people either love it or hate it, I never would have come up with Cloverfield unless they approached me about Cloverfield. I never would have come up with any of the creatures on Avatar unless it was brought to me. So I always have to remind people that I, I don't dream this stuff up. Yes, ultimately I'm sitting down with pen and paper trying to extract the idea out of a client's head, but if they let me do whatever I wanted, none of the creatures you've seen that I've worked on would look the way they do. So with my role on Star Trek, it really is, I don't want to say lead, it's a nice title to have, but everyone has contributed. And there's been so many people, as you've seen, Brian Fuller, at the beginning of all of this, he set the tone and the trajectory for what we're doing with the Klingons. And like it or hate it, I personally love it. it he was the one that planted the seed for some ideas that then I thought, let me run with that. The end resulting designs that we have are definitely a combination of a bunch of people working on it, but also paying attention to the franchise. You always got to like open up that book and go, ah, oh, yeah, that's right. I think I need to reel it back in because even though I said I wasn't like a huge Trekkie, I'm a Trekkie enough to make sure that if detached from this production, or any of them for that matter, when I watch it, I expect, I have the same expectations as everyone else. I want stuff to be like a Klingon, but maybe spiced up a bit. I want stuff to be like that character. I have that exact same expectation, and everyone on the show, for all intents and purposes, is a Trekkie in that regard. We all want the same thing. So it's kind of interesting to, to see the, uh, the passion distributed the way it is online. And um, and for people to not actually realize we're not we're all about this the same way you are, and I think that the proof is in the pudding. You know, when when everyone sees the show, uh, I think that the the shift will be how much people love the work that everyone's done. And it's like you were just alluding to. It is a big machine, lots of gears and cogs, lots of different players involved from costume, props, creature design. Uh, fabrication, uh, it's just so many different things. And I throw in catering as well. If you don't have a well-fed uh, uh, crew, it's hard to do your job. So everyone plays a part. And uh, thanks for your time. I know you've got to you've got to run here pretty soon, but I'll finish with one question. Uh, thinking think about the movies again. Um, it's a two-part question. A, was there any creature that you designed that didn't make it into the final film that you wish had made it? And B, what would you say your favorite creature from all the, the Kelvin Universe films was, that the ones that did make it on screen? Well, when you work in a film, you're doing tons of designs, so there's so much that doesn't make it into the production. And because of that, it's not like I've always felt that one character should have been in there. Um, it really, when the director chooses a design, that's a victory. You know, even if it's not the one that you liked, it's just it's such a victory to know that you can move on. I have to say, though, and it's maybe not the one you'd expect, but the the big red creature. I really, really enjoyed that design for so many reasons, and it's it's a design that again is so well not so provocative. But there's a lot of people that have opinions about. Why is it red? Why is it a predator? We have actually answers, and we didn't make them up afterwards. Everything is justified biologically um, on that creature. And it's, it's, again, because of the way JJ and I, well, the way I like to work and the way JJ also likes to work, and we collaborate so well together, everything must make sense. Biologically, the creature needs to have a purpose. The creature needs to have a motivation. So I treat all my creatures and characters the same way an actor would read a script, knowing that their character has to have a reason to do something. And we got the chance to do that with the big red creature. And 
the thing also about what you design, wh where I end in design is like so early in the process of a creature or a character looking great. A pencil sketch, a sculpture, I hand it off to the next round of people and they're the ones that turn it into an amazing makeup. And then the performer under the makeup brings it to life. And with the big red creature, it's just a static design until ILM infuses it with the great lighting, great texturing, great rigging, all the great things that go into making it come to life. And when I see it, it's a little bit of me and it's a whole lot of other people. That is one of the greatest privileges in what I do is have other, I shouldn't say other, have actual great artists do their thing to um, what efforts I put into uh, design. It, it's an incredible privilege. So I have, to, I have to ask then, why is it red? Ah, it is red because it seems incongruous to a predatory animal in the snow to be so exposed. It's an apex predator, but it is not a surface dwelling creature at all. It's an underwater creature. And if you look at Humboldt squid and other deep sea creatures, the ones that are the most predatory or the ones that want to not be eaten are the ones that are actually red. And the reason why, red is the first color to drop off the spectrum in the ocean. So red was a choice that worked as a real nice stark contrast against the white snow, but a, bio a biological justification because of the fact that it's an apex predator that lives in the water. That's, that, that's fantastic. And by the way, it's my favorite creature as well. I have to say for all three movies, I think. So. Great, thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for speaking to us. If there's anything else you want to promote or plug or anything else you're just really excited about right now? Um, I'm going to stay away from promoting anything other than Star Trek Discovery. Great. <laughs>